So basically, I want to tell me more about like who you are outside of <laughs> like what you do as a profession. Like, what such a broad question. It is a very broad question, no, but no, it's no, meant you to be an to easy be more one. More specific. More specifically, <laughs> what did you do before you started your career? He like can't focus me. Yeah, don't worry. Don't make me do that. It's fine. Oh my gosh. Why did I did you go to school? Did you go to um, college? Yeah, I did go to school. And I did IB, which like International, international Baccalaureate. Baccalaureate. Interesting choice. Yeah, I thought I wanted the challenge and then halfway through it was like, I'm not sure what I was doing. It was a lot of work. But um, yeah, and then applied for unis, got into uni and then deferred my place to model. Which university was it? For Kings okay, to study geography, and then um, after my gap year, I called them up and was like, "Actually, can I defer again?" And then they let me defer again. So now I'm on my second gap year, and I think I'm going to call them up and just like cancel my place because I don't want to. Third go gap to year. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like if I take a third, I'm not going to go for a while, so I might as well just cancel my place, just continue modelling because I'm enjoying it. I think as well, of course, it's like the classic problem of like modeling, it's not forever, you know? Like, yeah, that's the thing. And everyone's always saying, like, even my mum said today that everyone keeps asking her, like, is no one at uni yet? And my grandma's always like, oh, what about uni? But I always think I can go whatever age. And also I want to go in London and I feel like London's a lot easier to just like, be an adult at uni. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the plan, just to model, make some money, save the money, invest it, and then maybe in like my 20s go to uni sounds like you should have done yeah. economics <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it even goes on that's the plan so you've been modeling for like a year then is it Older? yeah well for like a year full time and then i was modeling at school when for like the last like the last year of school but i was just doing like test shoots and then fashion weeks because my school was really strict so i couldn't do much else but i think that's like the better way to do it like you hear all these girls who are like 16 dropped out of school like I think there's a lot of promises and we're promised big things and then kind of realise like two years into it that they now don't have an education and their career is like slowly coming to an end. I think that's a massive problem as well for like a, a large portion of the people I talk to who mm. are either at the later stages of their career now where they've considered things and like they like might have turned down opportunities they were taking when they were younger and now like avoid the education whereas you yeah. brought yourself to it where you can now return to university or yeah I, yeah education. I think I came from like a really like privileged like position as well like in my life and my family and my school were all really understanding and because I had other options in life everyone was like just wait until school's done but I think there's lots of girls that don't come from as like 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 their families aren't like like going into modeling is like the best option for them so I think that's what lots of girls do from other countries and then like I don't know. I think they're also like the more competitive girls as well, because they don't have as much to fall back on, which, um, yeah, is like a bit sad, like the sadder side, I think, sometimes, to modelling. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, sad <laughs> side as well, unfortunately. A lot of sad side. <laughs> which, yeah. how do you find, like, comparative, the kind of initial expectations versus, like, the kind of realities of the situation after you started or is it kind of exactly what you expected almost um i don't think anyone except the models and the people in the industry really know like what we go through or the people close to us like when you like my family who've witnessed me like coming in every day from fashion week like they know what it's like but i think a lot of people still view it as this really really glamorous life where we're just like flown about and given loads of free things and like yeah that is the case for like five models <laughs> like at the top but I think the rest of us are just like I don't think it's what most people imagine but I also I don't dislike it I'm grateful for the opportunity so that's why I'm kind of just riding it out seeing how long I can do it for um You've been where? So like you've worked in France and Milan. Yeah, yeah, I've been so lucky. I've worked in like Paris, Spain, Italy, New York, and then like I'm off to Australia in like three days, which is I'm so excited. Incredible. Yeah. And then after Australia, do you have many plans for kind of where you see your future in modelling, or is it just a kind of? I don't really know. I'm just kind of seeing how it goes. 
I'm not putting too much pressure on myself. I think maybe half a year ago when I just kind of, no, maybe a year ago when I just moved to Paris, and it was kind of like, okay, right, this is it. Like it's starting now, everything's legit. You've got agencies everywhere. It's gonna happen and like big things will happen. And I've heard this from loads of girls, like you'll book one big show and you think like, this is it now. Like everything is going up from here as soon as you do one big show. And then after the show, like the next day, you're like, what's gonna happen now? And then like you're back to where you were right before the show except that you like have that one thing which i think is it's like really really common and then a couple girls will like catch something big and then it will like take them up and i think everyone else is pretty much just like waiting for their like big break or you just kind of accept that yeah maybe that will happen maybe it won't and like just kind of live in the moment and just appreciate everything that i can to do with traveling and meeting all these new people just kind of go with that I think that's quite a rational perspective, especially when, like, from my experience anyway, it is very yeah. much the way that, you know, you get one big thing and then, like, everyone's, like, making a big deal out of this, like, yeah. job, which is, of course, like, an incredible opportunity and the rest of it. And, like, that one-time paycheck might have been nice. Yeah. But then, of course, there is the actual issue of then trying to resolve this into, like, is it a career? Like, you know, yeah. like at the point of questioning, like, can I pay rent monthly without, I mean, you know, you've got a long time between each job pays. Yeah. And that kind of thing. Like, yeah, I think that's what's so bad. So people don't realise that it can take, they say, what is it, like 30, 30, 90 days, 60 days? Oh, they claim like originally it's 30 days, isn't it? Yeah, 30 and then, days. Like, <laughs> and then it's like, but some places they say three months they have to pay you. But then I've had jobs that have been like over half a year and I haven't been paid. And the agency is like, yeah, yeah, we're chasing it. But I mean... There's only like two accountants in the whole agency chasing hundreds of jobs from like all these different models. And you're just kind of waiting until like one day you just like go and check your account and like a bit of money's popped up, but you never know when it's like gonna come in, which I think is, is like a really like tricky side to it. But I don't really, I'm so lucky that I, when I live in London, I live with my family. So I'm not really having to think about rent that much, but I've heard like terrible stories of like this one model in America, she was like, because they have to pay taxes, not taxes, in their, what is it? Their health insurance based on their income. And they do it, the way they calculate your yearly income is by your past three months times by four. So the first time that they calculated her health insurance, it worked out that she was on like the lowest rank because it just happened that she had no jobs that those three months. And then the next year when she had to do it, they calculated it and she just happened that this giant job fell in those three months so they calculated it and it put her in this like really high bracket she couldn't afford her insurance she couldn't afford where she was living anymore because she had to now pay all this insurance stuff and she was now working two extra jobs at restaurants on the side of modeling or because like it's just so unpredictable which i think is really is really difficult for most people as well and kind of we're living all over the place which is another issue with rent because you never really are like renting anywhere or have a like proper home I think for a lot of us so yeah but when she told me that story I was just like realized how hard it can be when you reach those like adult stages of having to afford like actual things in life without knowing when you're next going to get paid it's just kind of crazy yeah I, like I've been in quite a few interesting economic <laughs> situations through kind of relying too heavily on the very occasional paychecks that yeah. come through and then obviously it's not a problem when you've had like a nice month or so like you say but then trying to come back from a big recession of not having any work for yeah. over a month which is almost unthinkable in most jobs but equally like we obviously you've had a good experience of it because i mean you're still in the industry I'm right still, still going didn't, sometimes i don't but, know why i do question it but I think that is actually like a disturbingly common like it's comment from so... everyone. Everyone's like, I still don't know why I do it. Yeah, like some yeah. days, like I can completely understand as well. Some days you wake up and you've like you've not had any jobs for like maybe like six weeks and you're like, <laughs> what? I've done like a couple of editorials for no money yeah. and then I've run around all these castings and yeah. I think that's it. and that's another thing people don't realize like you don't get paid for editorials. Like there's so many things that you don't get paid for, but they're like, oh, we're giving you exposure. And then like you never see it or you see it and the picture comes out and it's rubbish or, oh yeah, I did my first magazine cover the other day and it came out and you can't see my face in it. No. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. So yeah, I haven't told anyone about that. No, well now I have. <laughs> I think as well, and you know when people ask you what magazine you're gonna be in? Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, I don't know what 
they're gonna show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comes out like I was in another man as well, and like you just couldn't see that it was me at all. Like it was like slight, slight it's little so resemblance. Like, oh. And like you do that whole day of free work, thinking you're gonna get good pictures out of it, like to put in your book or for more exposure, and then you can't even see your face, and you're like, I. Just... And they never put your name. Yeah. yeah I, I thought that was terrible as well. Like a lot of time when I was like. First getting a magazine and look for my name and nothing. Like most of the time you don't get any real exposure from the jobs they claim to. Yeah, I think you just have to really enjoy like the the other stuff around it because I don't think that I don't find the modelling itself is what's the fun bit. Like I don't particularly I think maybe I'm starting to enjoy it more, like expressing myself in front of the camera. Like I know a couple people who are like, Oh, it's such like an an art form and all this stuff but I feel like that rarely happens when you are truly like in control and you are expressing something if you're doing e-com and you're just selling like a t-shirt like you're just there for the money you know because you're not expressing anything especially if like your head's not even shown or something like, which happens so much um I don't remember where I was rambling with this <laughs> but um yeah um yeah oh yeah yeah that you do it for like the other things mm -hmm. so like being in Paris with my friends in the summer like you don't really mind if you're not getting jobs as long as you have enough money to kind of get you through and not end up in debt at the end of it yeah. um, roller coaster roller coaster emotions. yeah I think that is the whole kind of draining aspect of this job like the uncertainty yeah. the constant like like when I was arranging to meet you and you were like oh well you know I won't obviously know until like the night before yeah I think that's that's another thing like People ask it most at Fashion Week when I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing Fashion Week this season. And they're like, what shows will you be in? And they ask me this like a month in advance. So I'm like, you realise we get called like the day of or the night before being like, okay, you have to be up at eight in the morning because you have to be at this show at this time. I think that's another thing that also I didn't ever expect coming into this. And, you know, it's not really known that like I, we can't plan anything in advance. Like I can't plan holidays, days out with my friends. And if I do, I have to call the agency and be like, hey, I would like to go on a day trip in two weeks on this date, like, can you please book it off? Which, it's nice because part of me likes the spontaneity, but then it's also difficult for everyone else, on, like, around me to understand, like, my friends and my family to kind of grasp this concept that, you know, I will find out the night before what I'm doing that day. And it's also frustrating if I, like, don't make plans with someone and then the agency's like, you have nothing on, which has happened for the past two weeks, solid, so... <laughs> That's going great. But yeah, that's a, a huge frustrating aspect of literally just not being able to really plan your life at all. Just like living day by day. Especially when like everyone kind of goes on about the freeing aspect of it. Yeah. Like that, that always kind of got me the irony of the fact that like when you're getting sold this new job idea, everyone's like, you'll love it. Yeah. Like, you know, you get to never have to decide on like a regular schedule. Mm -hmm. And that, that sounds great. <laughs> like, yeah. But then, when it comes down to the actuality of like you know relationships or going family family holidays, you know family's birthdays, like yeah, like big events like a wedding, like because I can I feel like it's okay to take off a chunk if I'm like okay, well I'm going away for this holiday, but then suddenly saying like oh this one off thing somewhere, then sometimes I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm a burden on the agency, and I know that a lot of other girls have gone through this when like you don't want to call up and ask the agency something or this and that when it's like. You're paying them a third of what you earn basically and then you shouldn't feel bad going in and asking questions and stuff like that or like being like hey can i take this day off for a doctor's appointment or something i always feel like i'm being rude or whatever especially when technically speaking we hire them i thought that was the irony of it because like it feels yeah. like you're definitely employed by them because they kind of choose if you join yeah. them but then at the same time on a technical aspect, we pay them to do our job yeah. for us. Like. I know. There's so many. I also think when you when you enter it, like, the agencies, like, I love my agencies now that I'm with, but the old one I was with, like, you're promised, like, so, not promised, but I remember sitting down with my mum be just before I signed, and they're saying, like, oh, like, this can happen, this can happen. Like, we had this girl, and she did one test shoot, and then she was, like, picked up by Burberry, and now she's shooting here and there. And you kind of think like, well, that can be me. Like, I'll do one test shoot and then, and then Barbara will want me. And then suddenly I'll be on the cover of Vogue. Like they said, just happened to that girl. And like, they tell you all of these like really amazing things that have happened to girls. And they don't tell you like, oh yeah, but like 80% of our models do like one job every two weeks and like all this stuff. Or they'll say like, yeah, like 
like we have girls making like 10 grand a day and you're like wow and it's like yeah you might get one job that pays 10 grand a day and then you won't have another job for like three months because i know big girls who are like that but it seems like they do huge things but then they won't do other things for months and then like you have to live off that money for like the rest of the time which it's not realized like how spread out everything is i think that is also like the classic nightmare as well where you're like ah oh, like you suddenly have got this like yeah. echelon and there's no real system to it in the sense that like you don't get a promotion like another job like mm. it's not like a literal promotion in the sense that like there's no real promotion you can get other than someone will hire you more but yeah. then because of the freelance basis of it it makes it quite a nightmare and even like people who get cut off boards as well like you could do an exclusive one of my friends did a gucci exclusive for his mm. first season ever first job ever did the That's gucci crazy. exclusive and then like obviously his mom was blown then he had this like nice big budget while he was out there and then like that was it then he didn't get another thing for like yeah God knows how long. I, that happens to a lot of people i think especially if you're like one of the kids that like booms at the beginning if it's like really difficult to sustain it a lot of people like aren't used to that and then they come like back to like our level and then they're like this is so hard and I'm like welcome <laughs> this Reality is what it's is like that, right? <laughs> yeah yeah I find like another one of the main things about it is that there's there's it's so much down to luck and chance it's not really apart from like maintaining your Instagram and having like as many followers as you can and you know like doing what your agency says and turning up for castings on time like the rest is completely out of your hands like 90% of it is just like down to people's opinions of you like sheer luck that like that person happens to like your face and then like the agency pushing you I think that's so frustrating that like as an individual like your own job like in other jobs like the more work and effort you put in like the more rewards you get like you can move up you can do better and you can know that like if I work harder I'm gonna do better in this but I feel like modeling's just not like that like you can work as hard as you can want and like as hard as you can and just like still get nowhere and then you see other girls who are like barely trying or it's like their first like week on the job and then suddenly they just like take off it's just like just the way it is you know I think I'm not gonna cry. Sorry, I've got something. <laughs> Get a bit emotional <laughs> there. You know, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I think that's yeah. everything for you. No. Right. So before I started modeling, I had no thoughts about it whatsoever. It didn't enter my mind frame in the slightest. I thought it was about vanity and the idea that people have of my life modeling is the idea I had of other people's lives who are models, um, which is a wrong view that it's a party all the time basically. Um, so for me what my real life was studying towards being a journalist, which I am now. I started in Liverpool Echo newspaper two days ago as part of a graduate scheme for the Mail. So even saying that statement nearly bored me to death. So that's really what it is for people and I think a lot of people have a similar story where they go to Fashion Week in Paris or Milan or whatever and their pictures are amazing because the picture does speak a thousand words but the thousand words aren't necessarily true, that's the thing I've learned. Um, so these people come from like Slovakia, Slovenia, Russia, all over the world. I don't know why I just named three states very close to each other but they come from South Africa, Australia, the United States, everywhere. Um, but what they do is to take their pictures and the pictures are what are propelled to the rest of the world and their followers. And so that's where this image of the party comes from. But they all go home to their lives, to their mums who wash their clothes, or to their own place that's a little box flat in Williamsburg where they're sad. So there's actually a lot of anxiety and a lot of unhappiness and yet the pictures remain these glossy images of what it's not actually like. I think I still wish you could like one of my experiences is that you get sold this big picture and you, you get sold like, oh you're gonna fly here, you're gonna do this with this big brand, you're gonna work with so and so, like, and of course like no one tells about the smaller details, yeah. like, a lot of the nasty surprises is kind of like the option lists. Yeah, exactly. And the people use these words, you're, the people who are meant to be taking a profile role with you, i.e. looking after you, your agents and your bookers don't actually tell you the small print um, it's left to you and that's fine if you're savvy and you're a bit smart and you're well versed or you're an accountant or a fucking lawyer 
But a lot of these boys are 17 and excited. And when there's a 17 year old excited boy who thinks he's going to be having sex, taking drugs and partying all the time, the last thing he's going to do is read his contract. Um, the, the main issue with that is the fact that it's a self-employed contract. You have to declare your own taxes, you don't have a boss, you don't have protection and you don't have rights. And all those things come with a contract with an employer. But your agency isn't your employer, it's a middleman between you and money from them. Um, and a lot of people don't realise that. Um, so there isn't any protection and there isn't any lessons on what the things mean. Things like option, uh, first option, dropped, like, you know what I mean, cast, and I didn't even go know what see, I, yeah, yeah, go I see. I still to this day I struggle to see what a go see is. What's the difference with a casting? So you aren't told what these things are. So um, that's one massive problem with uh, fashion. And I actually gained a bit of respect in my agency because I was a bit older and a bit more savvy. Um, not so much smart, but definitely interested in knowing what was really going on. So they offered me a role in as a placement to to work there as a booker, but with, with an eye on looking after the younger boys because they seem to look after me and they seem to think I have some sort of inside knowledge but my only inside knowledge is opening my eyes and asking questions and when you ask questions you may or, not, may or may not get answers but you at least get more questions and so I don't fully trust it and I can see why it harms young men and young women. It also puts you very much at odds with like your own understanding of what you're actually doing, like especially because you're like you guided, you guided and like led down this kind of trail, and then you're like, ooh, it's so mystical and like. For me, I don't even think you're laid down a trail. I think you're shown the trail and they put some bait at the other end of the trail. The bait being money and the trail being the traveling. I don't think you're laid at all. And I think that's a problem. They hold your hand until you sign a contract that signs your money away. And I don't think it's so cynical and evil like I'm explaining. But it's definitely them turning a blind eye to responsibility that they should have. And when I say they, I mean agencies, I mean bookers, I mean mother agencies. And... I think it's just a blind eye. They don't want to take on the workload that a professional contract would. Of course. And especially when they're not getting paid the full price. You know, if it was just them being the client rather than the client being the other person and them being the middleman. Yeah. I think negating their responsibility in that sense is probably one of the... But there's no... How would you put it? There's no one to hold them accountable. Fashion's whimsical, it has no walls, it just floats everywhere. There's no 9 to 5, there's no rules, there's no set rules. So it's hard to clamp it down and it's hard for the government to make laws, employment laws. But in self-employment and in fashion especially, there isn't really any meaty laws to grab onto. It's all really bare bones and that, that, in other agencies too, like we talk to actors and singers and creatives and artists. They work in cafes all the time. Uh, they have other jobs. I have worked in a cafe. I'm pretty sure you work in a clothes shop. Oh, yeah, no. So, people ask me, why do you work in this cafe? And these are people who are going to be talking to me for one minute. And how can I possibly explain what we're talking about in one minute? So, I just say, because I'm home, because I have time. But the, the reality is, is that the work is so protracted and you need to have money. And you need to have your own money. So. I think also, like, that was one of the like things for me that came up was a real issue because like at first you kind of like you know you got the the idea like oh you know like maybe this is going to be viable as like an economic interest for me and like maybe this could progress to something as a full time job yeah. but then like the bracket between working a lot as a part time model yeah. or working as a full time model the gap is immense like to try and bridge that gap. It's true. It's it's a really strange one because I've been faced with the question: Are you a full-time model? And I suppose there's two sides to that argument. If I said yes, the, the facts are that I was working once every month and a half if I was lucky, with no prior knowledge to the job except the week of the job where I'd be told, "Right, me, are you available next week to go to Italy?" Which sounds amazing, but. Had I had a real job, that would have took me away from it. So, I suppose in a sense that it was my only job, it was a full-time job. But a full-time job should be steady work, and it definitely isn't steady work. So, I mean, even as like a freelance photographer or something, like you'd expect to get more work than you do as a model, like, and you wouldn't put yourself a full-time photographer if you made your so money elsewhere, which is like, exactly. and it lands you in that awkward bit of like. 
good tops and stuff like that. Now, like, I had... Yeah, like, real life. You get some horror stories as well. Like, you know, in America, some kind of zone, they base, like, on your last three months for your health insurance. So if your earnings in the last three months have been with Gucci, but then you haven't worked since, then you've got to pay your health insurance, like, vice versa. Like, those kind of issues, like, come up all the time. Money is the biggest issue in maker in that industry because people are like one of the frequently asked questions I get is do you make loads of money and I say no and they say what's the most you've ever been paid for a job and that's always a follow up question and that is 900 pound a day for three days in common with Gucci so 900 out of 900 is whatever three, three times 900 that's a lot of money and that does sound like a lot but the facts are that I earned that over three days and it was the only three days that year that I did it Yeah, exactly. so my earnings for the year in modern were something in the reach of 10 grand which is amazing but then including taxes etc and the fact that who can live on 10 grand especially when it was 22 at the time it's nothing it's even though at one point I did have a bulk check of, I'll be honest, I'll be frank, 4,000 euros into my account, turned into 3,600 pounds, that's a lot of money at one time. But then for, I think, six or seven months after that, I didn't earn a penny, so what would you rather? And then I went and worked in a call centre at home in Newry, in Northern Ireland, which made me sad. But what, what made me happy was I had money every month, yeah. every single month. I think it's something that you completely undervalue when you've got a regular job. Yeah. And then I had this like crazy idea where I thought like modeling was like the dream job, like everyone else seems to think it is. Yeah. Just for the fact that you get like this freedom, like quote unquote yeah. freedom. Yeah. Well, what freedom does is strips away your structure, and structure's good for me. That's why a, a monthly paycheck was good for me, because I knew my phone bill was going to get paid for one. There's been times where I've been in Paris, no 3G left on the phone. An unpaid bill, no money because a burger's 17 euros, and not no knowledge of what I now know, like monoprene and places to get cheap food. No knowledge of that because you're thrown into it. So money's a massive factor, and everything comes down to what it can do to someone, and what it does to people is plays your head. When is my next paycheck come? Have you ever met someone who's uptight about money because they don't know when they're getting it? They're hard to be around, so that can affect relationships. I had a relationship that struggled because of, my, because of my uncertainty about life and how it actually made me lazy because I was being looked after by Gucci very well. They were collecting me outside my front door of the hotel they paid me to be in and reimbursed me dinner if I spent money on dinner. And I, I, what did I have to do? I just showed up in Florence Airport or in Bologna Airport, got taken to Florence, got taken to a studio, got taken home, got my dinner paid for my day in a lovely hotel. What did I have to do as a 22 year old with my own brain? What do I want to watch on Netflix tonight? You know what I mean? It's it's degenerative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. What what was I going to pick from the menu? Is the only choice I made. So, and that sounds amazing, but it's not because you're alone. You're not using your mind. You're 22. You're watching. For me, this is my own life. You're watching your friends get uh, graduate jobs for thirty thousand pounds a year, and even though it's not about the money. For a certain time in your life, it has to be. It's a little bit all the money because you yeah. live in this world the same yeah. as everyone else does. Yeah. My friend said the other day, you need to have a healthy relationship with money. People who say money can't buy happiness, I think they're a little bit wrong because it can pay your bills and your bills can make you stress. So, you know. At least at the basic layer, that like everything in our society does in fact cost money. We drink drinking a coffee and a beer. I like beer and I like coffee and I like eating food at night. I like eating nice food. So money buys that. I'm not going to go down to a market. And, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to go down with, to a fruit market and start bartering and say I'll fucking brush the floor for them if they give me a bag of apples. It doesn't work like that. No. So you need money and in modern you don't get enough of it. And also, like, that was one of the things, like, it's a job that requires money. Like, yeah, exactly. I think... Almost any other commercial job yeah. won't really require more than maybe at most like 10, yeah. 15 pounds per maybe. Yeah. Travel food, etc. Let me lay it down for you. I got the bus to work this morning on a return ticket, so in the region of two pounds, and I spent six pounds on my lunch, right? So there's eight pounds, and it's a return ticket, so I get home. So what your agency will do is say you have a job in Paris in tomorrow, two days. You pack your bags. I don't live in a city with an airport, so I spend ten pounds to get to the airport and buy food at the airport. I get my plane that they pay for sometimes. On the other end, I get to my B destination by more travel. Whilst using 3G abroad before 15th of June last year, it costs money. 
this is all money. And you'll find yourself before you get to this job that pays gross two hundred euros that you've spent a hundred. So what you've actually done is left the opportunity of a real job that would have give you three hundred pounds at the end of the week to spend money or to get a hundred euros in your pocket. And for me, I had fun doing it for a while. But when I got to the point and thought, right, this isn't sustainable, this isn't enough, I stopped. And I think the massive issue with modern is that people don't, they get to that point and they don't let themselves think that they should stop. So people keep doing it, they cling on to it. And you've met sad people, I've met some really sad people. And it made me want to get out of fashion. So here I am as a journalist, doing what I want to do, what I really want to do. And if a nice job comes up, a nice creative project, or if a photographer that cares about art and not money, then I'm all over it. Which I think is a position that like a lot of people, like you say, aren't wise enough to take because yeah. Or maybe they don't even want to. Yeah, but no one wants to quit, but yeah. no. it's yeah. it's a complete like up in the air clash because no one wants to quit when you're in a situation like mud but it's like because yeah. I miss it, you know. It's gambling, it's yeah. like honestly it is like, there's nothing closer to the like fact that it could be like gambling as a professional pursuit. Like you're as likely to win a game of poker as you are to get the Gucci campaign, you know what I mean? Like it's such a like the odds are all the boys in the world, world, isn't it? Oh you could like and like then the the glorification and the hype of it, like yeah. everything binds you to it and then like everyone waves around the big paycheck at the end of the tunnel and you're like, yeah. Oh I guess I'll keep running and then like maybe I'll get in like you know, right? Surely I've gotta get in, like chances get more because you carry on in the game. Yeah. Like, no, it's bullshit. Ed. So I think where we left off we were talking about maybe just in Gucci, you were talking about how this kind of whole system and got you a bit kind of disenfranchised with it all and now you've moved back into your actual kind of career path while still attending the modeling jobs as well. Yeah. Well, considering model, modeling jobs is what I'm doing now, alongside keeping my actual passion as number one, and that's something that I was told to do at the very start, and you negate this information, the little information you are given by the people who are supposed to give it to you, you negate it because you're excited. I think it's very necessary to tell someone again and again and again, to remind a young fella to look after his money, to not go so crazy, to stop partying, and some bookers do. There's good people in fashion, believe it or not. Um, and I have two nice bookers, and they told me to like chill with money or whatever. But one thing I'll always remember, I actually just told someone who came over during our interview, um, because I find it quite an illustrative story. Um, so I mentioned Gucci, I was lucky enough to work for them, which is amazing. It's the creme de la creme, I think, is probably the top job in modern. So amazing. And I can't, can't really say I'm proud of myself, even though people say, well done, because you're picked on the basis of something so meaningless to me, which is image. Um, content is what I'm about. But anyway, they, I was picked for Gucci's e-com and their show, so I was masqueraded in front of these people at the top of fashion, and I did this beautiful show, and it was glamorous and great. And we're at this after party after the show, which was in Westminster Abbey. There was a big furore about it that it was in such a holy place, and I'm just, I was a complete passenger. I was walking around the cloisters of Westminster Abbey, looking around at all these beautiful people, all these celebrities, and this beautiful building, and these clothes that didn't make any sense to me. And we go to the after party afterwards, and I'm treated like a celebrity myself, because you know yourself, models are treated very well based on looks, which I think is quite weird. Um, and the casting director for Gucci comes up to me, Barbara Nicoli, and I'll never forget what she said. So she had picked me out of hundreds of boys who had attended the castings, maybe thousands, thousands who wanted to, definitely. And she said, Lee, what do you do? And I'm sitting there with fucking one glass of gin and one glass of wine because the drink's free. It's like Belvedere vodka, gorgeous Rioja, red wine, and like Hendrix. Like, I don't even know what gin it was, but it was the top, top shit. And I'm sitting there crazy drunk and she says Lee what do you do I was like Barbara bro how are you um, I do journalism in uni and I didn't know why she was asking me this and she said she sort of leaned in and it was quite maternal <laughs> and said Lee keep journalism as number one so basically that was a warning shot from the person who helped me enter this industry and it helped me enter a certain level of the industry but she still warned me that what I know now her warning was don't, let, don't get ahead of yourself, don't buy into it too much, don't rely on it too much and 
it took me a while and only in retrospect do I fully understand what Barbara told me and I'm really thankful for it and I see Barbara quite a lot and the way she looks at me is like through eyes of that maternal feel again and she respects me and I respect her and those are the little moments in fashion where I respect people and I'm glad and I'm happy and but a lot of people wouldn't have said what Barbara said because they want to completely exploit what you have and it's your looks. So. I think that constant like challenge you about this whole like way that almost like it's like it feels for me like almost like kinda like drunk and like reeling through the situation, you yeah. know what I mean? Like nothing seems like coherent, like it does in sobriety. It's like it's yeah. not like a calm, quiet moment where yeah. you hear the sage advice and like yeah. No, exactly. So that's the benefit of retrospect. I look back and I picked that moment and I thought, what did that mean? But at the time, like you said, it, it wasn't calm. It was like this storm of everything that was so new for me. And I managed to remember that moment even in a drunken haze. But even if I wasn't drunk, it still would have been a haze because everything was so new. I use the word alien because things can be new, but you can understand them. You can use your your educated guess or whatever but this is a new realm when you come from the streets I got scouted on the street going to an art gallery I'm Irish I'm from a small place where people drink in bars and talk shit well, not everyone obviously but I'm from a really not too different from yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly I'm from like a really a place where people care about things of real substance like nationality and rights etc and feeling that beer just beer or drink so to be flung into this world of fashion and glitz and glamour, it was like, it was fair, it was, it was a haze, it was even without the drink, and then the drink is just like this, it's mental, this is madness, and it, it was madness, so I really am um, appreciative of any advice or guidance that I'm given, so props to Barbara Nicoli, casting director at the top for game, um, she managed to step out of her own madness and give me a bit of advice, so... That was good. I think as well, like, something interesting that I always seem to find is almost that the people at the top have, like, a kind of interesting advantage where, like, they're no longer under the scrutiny or the pressure that they would otherwise be at a lower position in the job. So it almost gives them, like, a kind of point where they can give that sage advice. Yeah. Where, like, although, yes, their job requires them not to divulge like obviously too much of the brutal realities of something like of course it all comes around the sugar coating kind of process you know with these kind of people but then like at the very top you can almost cut the bullshit a lot easier than you can at the bottom exactly. and, like I think almost for the fact that like everyone's imbued onto the same trip it's like everyone's taking the same shit you know what I mean like everyone's going on the same route like you know the booker like they're all hyped up on the same fucking madness that you are like you're running on the same bullshit they're feeding you then like it all becomes like a certain sort of real even while it's not being real at all but yeah it's it's being trapped in like an accelerated time crunch and I think a lot of the time when I talk about modeling it pertains to fashion week which is a week of madness and then another week of madness and another week of madness so it's, it's actually the guts of a month of madness where it's really hard to step out of the madness, the bubble, and look into it and say, right, this is my logical approach. And it's very not logical. And you, like you said, um, it's the bookers included, it's the cast and directors included. It's a, it's a circus for a month. And I find when I have enjoyed modeling, because I do, and I complain about it so much, but I'm just trying to build an image of what it's really like. But when I do enjoy it is when I'm working with creative people who are passionate, and it's outside of Fashion Week all the time. A considered approach to a picture is the same way Michelangelo would have painted his pictures, you know, or John his sketches. Considered and artistic and passionate. And it can be that, and it can be fun. And I've met some of the best people of my life in modeling in fashion, but at the same time, it, it, it's so easy to get trapped and caught up in it. And especially when you're like so wrapped up in it, I think having an escape from fashion, like to me anyway, always seemed like the only way to be able to cope with the absolute like absurdity and fucking madness of it all. When you come home from three fashion weeks in a row, you sleep. You oh, sleep and right. you think and you think re retrospectively and you consider and it's like I remember when I was 18 and me and the boys went to Mali and Crete for a lad's holiday. We drank the fucking heads of ourselves for two weeks. When I got home, I just wanted to fucking look at my mum in the morning 
pet my dog and chill the fuck out. And it's the same with Fashion Week. It's it's a party, but it's also draining and you need to have a fucking break from it. You need to have that nice guy who you know is going to do Fashion Week and have a pint with him and take yourself away and say, well, what a day. And for me, that's the most important thing in my journey in fashion was finding mates like you, Dexter, and like... Uh, Jacob Collins and yeah so many good people and without the models obviously fashion wouldn't exist but without nice models and without meeting friends then I don't think anyone would do it I do think it would be bearable but like, no. I think my first season like was a complete eye opener for me like you have that moment of being like I've never been so lonely in public places in my whole life I know like, in a room full of people feeling genuinely alone and you like Wow. And people your age with similar interests. But they're so frightened of each other and so frightened of what might be and so frightened of their situation because they don't understand it. And we're all, we've all experienced that. And it's the top models too. I've spoken to top models. I know plenty. And it's the same. Uh, from, the, from the bottom to the top, it's the same. It's isolation. But it can also, if treated right, and approach right, be fun and informative and great, but you need to be in control. You need to be able to say no. Yeah, I think that's such an important element of it, like, and you have a job, but equally it's like the control aspect being how you are handling. I think that's an interesting yeah. thing because it's like the irony is because you're freelance, freelance, <laughs> technically speaking, you are in control constantly. Yeah. But the reality of it is, it never really is your choice. Cause the like, contract that you're on makes you freelance, but the contract is completely peripheral to everything that you're doing. And arbitrary price lists, like arbitrary dates, like you know, like everything is such like an. Arbitrary. It's a cop out. The freelance contract, the self-employed contract, is a cop out to save money and make more money off someone from the very top of the fashion industry. And it's well known and people still partake, I still partake and you still partake, so who's guilty? I'm sitting here complaining about the top and the rotten the rotten core of fashion, but you know, and you know we're the outside. Like, yeah, we are collaborators. We, we're, we're, go, we're going to bed with the enemy. <laughs> so, but at the same time, we're going to bed with the enemy and having really nice sex, but we have to wake up beside them too. Yeah. And that's the problem. But the question is, whose kid is it? Whose kid is it? <laughs> the end of the day, yeah. nine months time. Yeah, your parents. Yeah. You're in it together. So after nine months of being in bed with the enemy, you still have to wake up and father the child. So. And the child is quite often a lot of death, depending on who you live. And really good looking. Yeah, it's a gorgeous baby, but yeah. she's, she's not too healthy. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> she's called fucking polio. But yeah. No, it's an interesting, it's an interesting relationship because it is a relationship. It's not just them, them being the fashion world fucking us over because we're open on our asses to them. Is it many fuck. other jobs that you've got to be 24 hours nice or even like having to be 24 hours fashion nice? Like I go to call at 11:30. Yeah. Like, do you want to come to Japan? <laughs> was no, it like, no, I'd love to. But I but have an actual life. There's a life outside of it, and no one questions your life outside of what's inside. Like, yeah. two separate worlds of them. It's true. What are you thinking about this? I think it's uh, probably about time we come. Well, thank you very Sweet. much, Lee. It's been no an absolute bother. pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thanks. So, I basically just like you to talk a bit about like your life outside of modeling and kind of about like you. Okay. Um, I always like, I hate this question because I know it's the worst feel like thing. I don't do much. <laughs> um, well, aside from modeling, I go to uni and do German basically, but I'm doing architecture next year because that's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Like, I just go to uni. Do you have interests outside of university as well? Um, I like photography, I guess, and drawing. Um, yeah, I used to play a lot of sports as well, but like, I don't know, since being in London, I haven't really found a way to like continue it. So, yeah. A lot less greenery, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, like, how did you get into the industry? Like, um, 
I was scouted twice. I was scouted once when I was 16. Um, and like at the time, I sort of thought of asking because people were like, oh, you know, you should be a model all of that. And I was like, mm, whatever. Um, and then like I was scouted again during my gap year um, and just took it from there, basically. Yeah. Who were you scouted by then? Um, I was scouted by Select when I was 16, and then the second time it was just the woman who runs my old agency, yeah. <laughs> How come you switched agencies? Um, I don't know what happened, like, when I was scouted by Select, they told me to, like, give me, no, give them my contact details, um, but, like, I can't remember what happened. I think it was because I had, like, exams or something, like, it just didn't really work out, so I just left it. And then we'll scout it again and was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so like, how long have you been, when, when was that, when you got scouted? Um, like March last year, I think, yeah. So like, I was, yeah, I was scouted a year ago, but I haven't really actually done that much, <laughs> like in that time, yeah. I think it's always the way though, because when I first started, I really didn't book yeah, like much yeah. at all. <laughs> like, and it took me ages to build a portfolio. Yeah, and like I'm still building my portfolio. Like, it's one of them. <laughs> but, like the thing is as well, like with university, I imagine you're quite busy on top of yeah, like yeah. Because how many days a week are you in? Like, um, four. I mean, I don't really go to uni anyway. <laughs> but if I did, yeah. No, like before, um, when I had uni, I was quite busy. And also, like when I was first scouted, I was working at an accounting firm, like full time. Um, so yeah, I didn't really have much time then. Yeah, of course, like yeah. working two yeah. jobs, <laughs> quite a tough one. Yeah. Especially with the kind of basis that model it, uh, modeling is kind of yeah. like run on that you really yeah. only find out. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was such a struggle. Like I told my boss that um, I'd started it, and it was kind of like you know. Every now and then, if I like have a casting or something, he just release me. And the first few times he was like, "Yeah, sure." And then after a while, he was like, "No, <laughs> you have to pick one." And I was like, "Okay," which is fair enough, I guess. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I think it's tough as well, especially like having to make a kind of decision yeah. based on like. I was like stable income, <laughs> fun job. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a shame as well because we almost see it as two different things when really, like, yeah. you should be able to exactly. have something that you enjoy as a passion as well yeah. as, like... Yeah. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> I think, is so, like, you haven't worked much since you started, or have you worked at all? Um, not really. I did, like, some runway shows in Fashion Week in September of last year, but otherwise... And like a few small like shoots for, not friends, but just like, I don't know, not like brands, brands, brands. Um, but yeah, a few like, a few of those, yeah. So like, who was it you worked for in September? It was like this one company that um, did shows for like up and coming designers. They were called like Oxford Fashion Studio. Okay. Um, yeah, so they had shows in like London, Paris, New York, um, Milan, that's the one. Um, so I did it in London and Paris. Okay, yeah. nice. Have you been abroad at all, or are you looking to get abroad with agencies out there? Um, I think that's the, like, goal, eventually, but I haven't really... Like, I don't even have an agent at the moment, <laughs> because, yeah, there was <laughs> some problems <laughs> with my last agency, but, yeah. So, like, I think, at the moment, I'm just trying to find another agency, and then, like, once I'm signed there, then hopefully I'll be signed abroad. So, like, what you said, there might have been some problems mm. previously. <laughs> but it, like, I don't even really know. It was just <laughs> such a mess. Like, um, I mean, the thing is, even from the beginning when she signed me, it's like quite a commercial agency. Even though, I don't know now, everyone's saying like I'm really commercial. But at the time, she was like, "Oh yeah, you're quite editorial looking, but like, we'll try and make it work." And then, um, just the whole time, like, I went to about five castings like the whole year that I was signed, like in total, and I was a bit like, hmm. Um, and yeah, and then in the end she was kind of like, um, you're not really booking jobs, even though I didn't go to the class. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, she just told me to go. And then also this model from my uni like signed um, at this agency. So I kind of like was talking to him about agency stuff and I said something about 
like my agent and this photographer like sort of having beef um and he told her that i said that and then like <laughs> she got really really angry at me <laughs> yeah like she blocked me on instagram <laughs> i was like never talk to any of the models again like from the agency yeah <laughs> that's crazy yeah <laughs> it's quite an immature reaction i know like, i was just like you know what like good riddance i don't have time <laughs> but i think as well like these kind of you know what is effectively like a personal mm -hmm. thing exactly like i think it's quite a difficult position it puts people in especially with like a working environment then coming yeah. into a kind of social sphere yeah yeah it was always kind of, kind of like weird because me and there are I mean, there are lots of models that are like quite old, I guess, in our agency, like 23, 24, and my agent's quite young as well. But there was always like a small group um, that were like around my age, like um, 18, 19, and like we were always really close. And she was always like, I don't know, trying to sort of be like down with the kids <laughs> in a way. Um, and yeah, and, like it was nice because, but especially when I first started, and like I literally knew nothing, like she was quite like nice and supportive and stuff um but i feel like she just let it get too personal like we'd all like go clubbing together and like get really drunk and like just i don't know it just got a bit weird <laughs> i was like i feel like i shouldn't have this sort of relationship with like my boss effectively <laughs> yeah it's just a bit weird yeah so i think like going on like mm -hmm. do you have much of an idea of what your kind of next plots are like have you made moves with a different agency yeah i do think as well like agencies can make the difference yeah you know because like my experience anyway yeah. was that that like you have a kind of like no kind of no backup at all yeah. like in sense of like well you kind of head into this a bit bland <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> And then you kind of like, <laughs> not at all, like um, you have this kind of not understanding of like how well should I be doing? Yeah, like, exactly. Because you know? I have so many friends as well, like this boy that um, I scouted um, and that was at my agency. I mean, he wasn't doing like amazingly, but he, like the week that I scouted him, he booked like ASOS and like did all this cool shit. Um, and oh shit, I'm gonna swear. Yeah, it's okay. fine. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and he's left now and he's with the squad and he literally is just like oh my gosh he's in australia at the moment doing like all these campaigns and like he's done um a campaign for adidas and stuff like that and i'm just like wow <laughs> and my mom always makes fun of me she's like isn't that the boy you scouted like what are you doing <laughs> I'm like okay <laughs> thanks mom <laughs> how do you feel like i know like a lot of people's families kind of like have mixed reactions yeah to Oh god, um, my dad at first wasn't too happy, even now he's a bit like, hmm, but it's kind of more from like a protective like point of view, because obviously there's so much like stuff in the media about like, um, sexual harassment and stuff, he's kind of like, just stay safe, um, but like my mom is like my number one supporter, <laughs> like she doesn't even have um, any social media but she knows all my usernames so she like goes to my Instagram profile on her phone and then she'll like send, like take a screenshot and send it to me and be like oh my gosh sorry like I love this shoot like this is amazing and I'm just like yes, <laughs> thanks mom, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's really great to have a supportive parent yeah. like, behind you, especially oh like yeah. in an industry that is quite like maybe cold. Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Because I think without this kind of like background support, it might become quite a hard job, and like <laughs> you know, especially like if you're struggling with like you say, like you had a bit of a fallout with yeah. like your agency and yeah. stuff. So like, but like getting back on the bandwagon I suppose yeah. with like a new agency will do you some good and I'm sure you'll do yeah, very well from hopefully, it. Hopefully yeah. But like the kind of experience that like you have with that guy excelling like yeah. out of nowhere kind of thing I think that's like the most like tantalising thing yeah. about modelling you see these kind of successes that mm -hmm. go from like zero to a hundred yeah, like in like, like so quickly <laughs> but like I mean, the co how common are these things? Like, yeah. like, there's the question, I think, like, comes up quite a lot when you kind of, like, 
but you see so much of it. Yeah. But then talking to other people, I've heard a lot of people been like saying the same things where you kind of like you start with these big hopes yeah. and expectations because yeah. you see like. Oh my gosh, and even some of the things like my old agent told me, and she always like told us all the same thing like, oh yeah, like you guys are gonna do Burberry and all this, and we were all just like, ooh, <laughs> we've made it, but like obviously it never happened. <laughs> well, not obviously, but just like it wouldn't have happened at that time, like you know what I mean, yeah. I think as well, it's tough because if you hear promises, mm -hmm. it's yeah, you get it like your hopes up, and yeah, then like yeah. especially like how old are you? Sorry as well. Um, I'm nineteen now, but I no, what am I saying? Yeah, no, <laughs> I don't know why I'm so confused. I was nineteen when I was scouted. I'm twenty soon, basically. Got you. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> like, I think when you like start you're quite young so you have like kind of yeah <laughs> excitement over it and then like a lot of the other models say and like you get so gripped by this whole kind of like cut off like was so, it just right then because my literally camera, right then yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, <laughs> i think you were just saying uh, you got in shape huh you have to get in shape for oh, the yeah. agency yeah um so yeah i spend like quite a lot of time like Doing that, you kind of have to really be like on top of your personal appearance and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I just like, especially for me, I just felt like I spent a lot more time like trying to be <laughs> like perfect um, than actually doing anything. But I guess I don't know. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I think as well, it's actually been really common with like mm -hmm. all of my models that mm -hmm. like at some point they've talked about like how it's had that kind of effect on them where they yeah. feel if anything more conscious of like yeah. how they look yeah. or like how they yeah. come across and that kind of thing like how would you say that's affected you like could you oh god i don't know like especially with the whole um like losing weight thing it was kind of like um a bit shit for a while but I don't know, like, I just noticed there were so many things that, especially in, in, like, the first few shoots I did, um, like, the photographer would show me pictures, like, show me the pictures, like, as I was going, I'd just be like, oh my god, like, I didn't know my arms looked like that, and, like, just pick off all these new, like, flaws to obsess about, and it was a bit mad, but at the moment I'm just like, mm, it's okay. But yeah, I felt like you really do start to look at yourself, like, in a lot of detail, yeah. I think that was something that I found really weird because I didn't actually like I do photography but yeah. being <laughs> being the photographer one like it's really a strange experience because yeah. I was not really that like I was conscious about how I like to dress but I like to dress in the way I do yeah, because exactly. I choose it but like exactly. not out of like people are looking at me kind of thing yeah. but then like I cared more about my skin yeah. I was like suddenly like overly <laughs> conscious if I was like oh like but a lot of my other friends who were also male and female models said yeah. the same kind of yeah. things. And I think, like, especially if you're younger as well, like, I think it could have yeah. quite a lot of an effect on you, like, because yeah. even coming into modelling later that, like, I did, like, I came in when I was, like, 21, maybe, almost 22. Yeah. So then it's, like, I had, like, a similar experience where I was, like, I thought I was, like, fully confident in myself, yeah. and then, like... <laughs> Suddenly, like, oh no, and seeing that many images of yourself, like, yeah. I wasn't used to seeing that many photographs, like, at God. all, like, you see, like, hundreds. Yeah, it's bad. So, like, yeah, I think the level of awareness changes entirely, <laughs> like. Sure. But, do you see yourself doing it for, like, a long-term kind of goal, I mean, or? I would like to, because, I mean, despite, like... <laughs> Ooh, the drama along the way, like, it is, I do enjoy it a lot, like, you do meet lots of really cool people. So, like, ideally I would like to, I just need to find a new agency to <laughs> get the ball rolling, yeah. What would you say, like, is the, kind of, your favourite element of it? Because, like, a lot of my models have, like, I've had real mixed experience. <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know. It depends on the shoot, I guess, like, um... I guess like seeing like what people come up with in terms of like the clothes and stuff and just like the ideas behind stuff I really like that and some people are just like just such nice people and like nice to be around um so being on set is fun and then also like I like how much of a like group thing it is like you need everyone there to like make 
the final image like what it is and I, like, I find it really cool when I don't know you just like see like everyone's like done their bit and like made the final image what it is I think that's quite cool yeah yeah I think like the collaborative element of it's yeah, always really impressive <laughs> that's the word I was looking for <laughs> no, sorry. but um, I think that's like it's a nice thing to hear as well because people yeah. actually like care like because I think a lot of people don't think like the models like yeah, even care yeah just stand there like all of this yeah and like it's interesting as well because you, you actually want to do modeling like uh, you, would yeah. you like you'd follow the path kind of like directly for yeah. the job rather than just for the cash because like oh, I mean, yeah, like because yeah. some people like are, like <laughs> just for the cash kind I mean of thing. that would be nice as well obviously but. Yeah, no, I do enjoy it, like, for what it is, as well. <laughs> the artistry and all that. Yeah. But I think... I'm trying to think. Yeah. <laughs> Just have a freaking moment there. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but, like, with education-wise, like, you're going to finish your, kind of, degree, and then what's your plan afterwards? <sighs> I honestly have no idea. Like, I, I just don't know what I want to do afterwards because I'm kind of like I want to do something like sort of creative um which is why like I'm switching from German the only reason I did German was because I missed my offer for architecture so I was like and I'd already taken a gap year I was like I don't want to take another gap year <laughs> um so I was like I'll just go to uni for a bit and then um and like doing the German will help with my research um so then yeah and I'm not even I'm not doing like pure architecture, I'm doing architectural and interdisciplinary studies, so it's kind of like architecture and then you like pick like some other shit to on the side. Okay, um, cool, like a, like a combined course yeah, almost. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna like do that <laughs> and then figure out what I'm gonna do after, like, because yeah, I just really don't know, I've never really known <laughs> what I want to do. You said you were interested in photography as well, is that something you'd be interested in pursuing? Um, Potentially, yeah. I feel like I don't really spend enough time doing it, but like, I could do... Yeah. I don't really know though, because I mean, I like fashion photography and stuff, but I feel like street is my, more my thing, but I'm not really sure, like, how do you, like, <laughs> make a living off life, you know what I mean? I never really thought about it. I think that's a constant challenge of artistic yeah. pursuits like trying to work the money back into mm -hmm. it but like there really is a lot of money out there in fashion and mm, yeah. there is a lot of money you can get to it does take a bit of work and a yeah. lot of a, a bit of work's an understatement a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you are in the industry for it yeah exactly. you know so yeah like even like for me as a photographer I've found so many more contacts and stuff and like yeah. you'd be amazed at like how many people are willing to help you out mm. like I think that's one aspect that I really like to take away from it that yeah. like you're surprised at the amount of times you can actually find assistance yeah. where you wouldn't yeah. expect it like yeah. have, like have you worked with many people repeatedly or since um, like that's a good question I think Oh yeah, there's this one photographer who I've shot with like a hundred times, well not a hundred, like four, I think, <laughs> but like <laughs> a few times. Um, yeah, I mean there have, yeah, there have been a few photographers that I've done shoots for like multiple times. Um, but otherwise, but yeah, because I haven't done much like actual paid work. It's not like I've done like stuff for the same client more than once. Um, yeah, basically. But yeah. No, yeah, you do, like, build, like, a nice network and stuff, and it's just, like, it's cool. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've got it from from you. Got it. Yay! <laughs>So basically, I'd just like you to talk a bit about you outside of the industry you work in. That's always a difficult question, um, as in like being asked to completely summarise yourself as a person. Of course, it's the most horrible question I could ask. But I guess what you want to kind of start with is like what I do 
and the kind of things I'm interested in that are non-fashion related. Um, and I think I am a not that common case for a model because I'm not that phased by it as an industry. I think it's 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 work, definitely work, but it's not my life goal. And I get asked that a lot from people are like, do you want to be a model forever? And I'm like, no, it's not an idiot. I know people will get bored with me one day and I'll wake up one morning and no one will want to book me anymore. And it has nothing to do with me, but it's tough titties, it's what happens. But no, I think yeah, I've always been a bit of a nerd, and so I think the things I like in modelling is the photography and the, the meeting the creators and the meeting the technicians and all of that stuff, because that relates more to my, my larger goal of what I want to do, because I wouldn't mind being a photographer or being someone who works as part of a production design or works as part of content generation, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know, like, me as a yeah, me as a person, I feel like modelling came out of nowhere and it'll disappear just as quickly. And so it's always good to keep yourself grounded and understand that you and your career as a model are very removed from each other and your career as a model is very disposable. But, yeah. So I know you work a lot with audio yeah. as a kind of Well I mean that's interest. like that started out as a hobby. Like I started out as a big nerd. I was the kid at school who dance class wanted to cut some songs together and I was like oh I can do that that's easy and they're like what and yeah eventually it grew into understanding how equipment works to doing little part-time internships and roles here with, with production companies and moved into actually working as a full-blown audio engineer which was a bit of fun um, and I think in terms of long-term goals I wouldn't mind focusing on that as my career and I think I always I always did focus on that as my career and yeah, like I have been an audio engineer since I was like actually made money as an audio engineer. Not heaps, but made money and used it as a career since I was about seventeen. So what is that, like seven years? It's a couple of old. I feel old. Um but yeah, it's it's interesting because that's a job that is is physically difficult. Like it is, it is fucking hard. You you get on site at six a.m. You leave at two a.m. You are unloading a truck. You are pushing things around that way more than you do. But I find it a lot more satisfying than modelling deep down because I am building something and I am actually part of the process. I'm not just there by chance or I'm there as part of it. I'm actually one of the creative forces behind something. And I I don't know if it's egotistical, but I find that a lot more validating and rewarding than just kind of turning up, shooting photos and leaving. Um, so I cultivated that a long time before I ended up doing anything as a model, and I think I'll be doing it a long time after. But that being said, I don't. recently I've also thought that I don't necessarily know if I want to be an audio engineer forever, which is a plot twist, but yeah. I think as well, in an industry in which there's so much change, it's hard not to, I suppose, like... Definitely. You definitely need to be flexible. I mean, even a good audio engineer within our industry, you have guys who do corporate stuff only, babysitting, like, radio microphones and a lectern for a conference or a bank's announcement. And traditionally you did. And traditionally you had guys who just did music and just did festivals and were really into the band scene, and guys who just did film. And it, I feel like, just like in the modelling industry, the only way to survive now is you need to learn to be flexible. You need to have a musical side, you need to have a money-making corporate side. And even then, you need to stretch out your understanding in the industry. You might be good at audio, but so are all the other audio engineers. You need to also maybe be good at giving some input to production design for video or understanding why lighting do what they do, because otherwise you, you don't stand out in the crowd anymore. And the crowd that you have to stand out in is every technician who has Facebook, not just every technician who's on someone's like contacts list on their phone. Um, which is funny because I, I find those two industries so removed from each other, but there's a lot of really eerie mirrorings there because it's the same thing as a model. Like, yeah, you can you can be a model. You can be some vapid, like, high beast model who's wearing all the cool latest, you know, off-white out pieces. And no one will book you because you're not actually interesting outside of the industry and it's the same thing in audio. If you're not friends with bands or you don't appreciate music, no one's booking you as a, as a band's engineer because they someone else. 
easily. They have so much access to everyone in the world that you definitely have to keep upskilling. I think... I think definitely parallels can be drawn in all of the kind of creative industries which unfortunately even though, like you say, they mirror the kind of industry that you find in fashion and the kind of same issues come up, I think, a lot. Like, more than anything, you realise that the moment you transcend into a different industry itself. Like, oh, completely, yeah. And like, the intransferability, I always find the funniest thing. Like, you know, you put down modelling on your CV and, like... No one takes you seriously, for exactly. starters. Yeah. <laughs> but then, at the same time, like, the irony is then found in the fact that you can draw so many parallels to other industries that you work in and Absolutely. especially creative industries. Well yeah I mean like I occasionally work as a photographer and I find it really interesting that whenever I've done work as a photographer I expected there to be... When you're a model you are in this weird dichotomy where you're like the bottom of the feeding chain. You're replaceable. You break your leg, you're sick, whatever, they'll look another boy who looks similar to you in hours but at the same time you're also uniquely you no one else looks like you or moves like you or whatever and so you're also irreplaceable at the exact same time but most of the time especially during fashion week you spend the time kind of being cattle like you have a fun time but you're one of 60 boys and those 60 boys are the boys who are cast out of 2,000 boys you, 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 you are expendable you're just a soldier on the battlefield but that being said, because you're at that bottom end, you see a lot of divas, and I thought that entering into the production side of the industry, I thought that being part of the team who was making it happen, we would have more people who were driven towards just getting a project happening. And it was really eye-opening and a little bit disheartening to discover that even when you're in the, like, you're behind the clock face and you're actually willing to, to be part of the production, yeah, still just as many divas. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> I think uh, the expendability as well is something that is a feeling throughout the industry like even as a non-model like aspect that if you're a stylist you're as expendable as the other stylists or the other models etc. Mm. I think sometimes people notoriously because uh, fashion's not all divas it's still a professional industry it still is obviously a business people are there to make money they're there to work but there is a much higher incidence of painful people in fashion and performance than there is in other industries maybe they're openly painful maybe there's the same number in like banking and finance they just they express themselves differently but i think a lot of that very diva behaviour that you get is because they have a deep down fear of knowing that they're replaceable and they refuse to just let go and accept that they're replaceable and just have fun while they're there and instead try to be some kind of memorable force and have a reputation for being a pain but also for being brilliant. Um, but it is very true. Everybody in, in fashion is expendable. Everyone. I mean, you can be the head of a brand literally the creative director and if the brand's investors especially if they're big enough to be a public company like Louis Vuitton or something they decide that they don't think you're making enough money you can be a creative genius you can be steering the brand in the best direction all the creatives can love you but no one's buying the stuff you're gone end of story and I think that translates right down to the bottom to the models as well the difference is that we are constantly reminded of how replaceable we are so I think we become a little at least most of the models I've worked with become a little about it and accept that it's a bit of fun until it doesn't play. I think the seriousness as well that is like imparted on the roles that are involved, I think that has a key kind of element to play in the sense that, like you say, you have this idea where it's like a complete kind of duplicity with the fact that you know that ultimately if they really want your look then that is a definitive answer, Yeah. but at the same time, you also understand, or you have to understand more than anything else, that like, you are very much the expendable element, and even more so maybe even than the other creative elements, and like you said... Oh yeah, yeah, completely, like, you don't, you don't just fire a stylist at the drop of a hat. A stylist is the, the workhorse behind your show, they kind of, they drive 
say you're a big brand with a massive budget, a designer might come up with 80 designs and the stylist refines them down to 40 designs and determines what order they're going to happen and how they're going to relate with the set design and all of that. They're a big force, but at the same time they can still be replaced if they end up with bad PR or they don't agree with the designer. Whereas a model, you break your ankle, you fall off your skateboard, you, you get sick or more likely you get hung over. <laughs> and you piss your client off massively but they call your agency and someone else is there pretty much at the same time, maybe 20 minutes later than you were going to be there. It's no real skin off anyone's back. And I think those are the moments where you realise that you are ultimately expendable. But at the same time, you also have those situations where a client, for no reason, might just love something about you. They might like your personality, they might like the particular face of your, sh like the shape of your face. You don't have to be... You don't have to be super pretty, you don't have to be super interesting, you just have to agree with the right person at the right time. And yeah, they'll bend over backwards, they'll fly you from the other side of the world, they'll do the most ridiculous things for you. But then you also still get reminded that you're expendable because the same person who was so in love with you, next day, next season, next year, doesn't want anything to do with you. <laughs> and like that, like, like no consequence to them whatsoever. Yeah. I don't think there's a single model who's worked continuously in the industry for like a set amount of time over a year period that they haven't at least felt the a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like no, to the point where, like, you know, Jibanchi, for example, for me, like, you know, it pulled off to this big thing where, you know, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the creative director is saying that, like, they want me and they're interested in me, but. Then you get to talking prices, and then it goes through the other people, and they're like, actually... We've changed our minds you know, for no reason! There yeah. is some other guy who said that, you know, he might have taken the lower rate that you weren't willing to accept for this season, etc, etc. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the, for me, the reason that I find the fashion industry quite complicated, and I can't just, like, throw shit on it in that way is I've worked on the production design side of things for events. It's usually bands, festivals, expos, but I understand how many parts there are in the machine and I understand how finite a budget is. And I get that ultimately, like, you drop... Lots of problems. As you were saying. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, yeah, you're driving a brand that is... Is, is massive. Like, like say, you, yeah, you're like the creative director of Louis Vuitton. You have this weird pressure where the brand wants you to stay really original and really creative, but not too creative and not too crazy because you've still got to keep in with the brand's identity. Otherwise, the buyers at the end of the day won't buy your shit. But you also can't be too boring and too predictable. And so you have to end up striking this middle ground as a, as a director where you want to be interesting, you want to be last minute, you want to be impulsive, but unfortunately that ends up meaning that the model that you loved in look 20 or look 30 or look 1 who was opening the show, suddenly you've had a change of heart, you want to change up the pace of the, the, the outfits, you want to put them in a different order, and he doesn't work in another outfit. He worked well in the first outfit, he doesn't work in another outfit, he just gets cancelled. It's just what happens. It's, I don't think it's ever anything personal when you get cancelled at like 11.30pm on a show that your call time is 7 the next day. It pisses everyone off. It, li it literally pisses every single person in the industry off. It pisses the agents off, it pisses the models off, it pisses hair and makeup off. But it's never personal, it's never people being divas, it's just, it's just how it works. And unfortunately I feel like it's so ingrained in the industry that it needs to be flexible that I don't know if it'll ever be any different. I completely agree in the sense that flexibility automatically demands something which is not like it's like the kind of classic concept of like the kind of man of literature you know like the on the literature like it's like the person who strives for this kind of singularity of mind to the point where it's not backable like you literally like as an economic pursuit it's not backable in the sense that like without a promised gain or a promised loss, like, you can't make an economic end of it. Completely, like, you need to apply a risk to fashion, especially, like, as a designer, if you're running a brand, you need to have a risk on, did I make the right choice, did I make the wrong choice, or there's no risk, there's no value in the reward. And I feel like that's how it is for a model, too. You have no say in your career whatsoever, but at the end of the day, when you choose to be available for a job, even if they cancel you, you've chosen to not be available for a full-time job or a consistent part-time job and yeah I think 
I think you, you need to have that risk there and have that kind of sort of vapid nature to it or there wouldn't be any like drama and magic in it. No one would be interested in the industry. It's just frustrating sometimes that that's the only way it works. But that is the only way it works, so yeah. I think that's precisely like <coughs> the point that was made by like another person that I talked to, Lee, who in fact I think you know, but <laughs> He, of course I know Lee, we all know Lee, everyone knows everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's crazy in the because industry, I'm everyone, you yeah. know everyone. <laughs> like, if you got a mind about you, you can meet them. Yeah. But I think he was basically, and I was agreeing, like, and we were putting forward the point that, like, it's effectively like a gambling system, you know, like, you go in it like a gambler would, you know, even if you're cutting it out like a high-end professional, like, you come out with these intentions and you can... I mean, I've always thought modelling is less like raw gambling. It's not raw chance. Like, I don't go to a Givenchy, not a Givenchy, but like a Versace show. I'm not booking, like, Versace. I look like a teenage girl. Like, I don't have any muscle. I'm not tanned. I know what, like, clients generally want. I think it's more like getting into cryptocurrency or shares or any of these, like, large-scale financial systems where you kind of have a bit of education about the market you're going for, but at the end of the day, you don't really know if the shares you're invested in are actually going to increase in value. You can be a bit educated and you can kind of know, I know this company that I'm investing in is going to release something soon, but I don't know how the public will react to it, I don't know if they'll manage it well, and I feel like fashion's the same way. You go into it knowing that you'll get some work. Everyone gets some work, whether it's shooting test shoots with a photographer you like, or it's booking back-to-back -back campaigns and making like ridiculous money you don't really know you know something's gonna happen but it's like calculated gambling it's somewhere in the gray area and I think that makes a lot of people uncomfortable about trying to understand the industry I think as like you say it does become like a complex matter in the sense that it's no longer so binary as straight up investment it's like yeah. it's not like you're looking at a property it's in a good area mm. you know it's gonna do well no, it's not oh yeah, it's a physical asset. It's always going to grow in value. You just have to wait. It's not like that at all. Yeah. It's more like a speculative value where you can wait and potentially, yes, the increase might be massive. Like, not accepting a, a deal where you're effectively an exclusive for a season. Well, I mean, that's the other thing that people often don't realise about the industry. Like, you hear that, that term thrown around. People get booked as an exclusive. It's like... Um, Ruben Pop, he got booked as a Dior Worldwide exclusive, and it was talked about by all of the boys at the time, high fashion models. And it seems like a great deal. It really does. Like, they pay you more, and you, you do the same amount of work. You book their campaign, you do a brand's shows for a couple of seasons, you're everywhere for that brand. But what people don't realise is that the finite amount they pay you, you're not allowed to work for anyone else in that year. And... Often it can seem like a large amount. I mean, some models get paid like, you know, 30, 40 K in a job, but then you work that out versus say like a full-time job over a year. And you realize that in that year, especially cause some of these guys are like 17, 18, 19 year old boys. They don't have skills in other areas, especially cause they've spent a lot of time investing in their modeling career. So they couldn't get the full-time job somewhere else. So that 40 K that they make is probably the only 40 K they're going to make in the entire year suddenly it doesn't look as crazy an amount of money if you're not able to work with anyone else. And I think these numbers are often thrown around in the modelling industry and it's glamorised. People are like, oh, you only worked for eight hours and you got paid 40k? And it's like, yeah, but I can't work ever again for the whole year. And of course, they don't mention the hours you work beforehand mm. to even achieve such an opportunity. As yeah, yeah, exactly. Well. It's like they don't mention all the, the, the intangible esoteric stuff that's not even obvious extra stuff, the fitting days and the rehearsals, but le, like the the years it took to get to the point of being in the right room at the right place and having the right attitude, the the Polaroids, the meetings with agencies, that am I going to get signed, am I not going to get signed? When you boil it all down and you take commissions and expenses and all of that shit out, you realise that what looks like crazy, when you hear the rumours, oh so and so got paid this, so and so got paid that, you realise yeah, but it's also boned their ability to do any other work for the rest of the year and they're actually not making, like, crazy money at the end of the day. When you look at it as your last 40k... Yeah. You know, like, I think that's the point that everyone misses, like... Mm. You know, it's amazing when I get the opportunity to work for, like, 
1,500 pounds a day. That sounds amazing, but then, like, obviously you leave out the content that people don't hear, which includes, oh, well, you know, maybe I went to 100 castings. Yeah, exactly. Like, you go to 100 castings, you land two, and then maybe you get, like, three days of e-commerce or, like, lookbook jobs, and you get, over three days, you might get 1,500 a day, but then you've got commissions... And after commissions, then you've got any expenses you owed your agency, which is usually quite extensive after Fashion Week. <laughs> and then, like the rest of the population, you have tax. Except you pay way more because you paid, you got paid in one lump sum. And so at the end of the day, yeah, you get a lot of money comes in, but then a lot of money comes back out. And you realise that you've actually not made more money than you would have if you'd just gone and become a teller at a bank or worked in a store. Yeah. That was an issue that comes up time and time again, I think, that, like, you don't really actually hear any of the kind of genuine actuality of the paycheck. It's like, you hear the number, and yeah. all that resonates with people is this large, large number that seems gargantuan in comparison to working a day. Large number if you're lucky. Exactly. If you, yeah, if you even get the job. But yeah. the problem is, everyone hears the large number and then forgets that maybe like 98% of the population of models doesn't earn that figure. Like, that figure is a special figure that only gets doled out. But it's the same thing as a lot of creative industries like that. I mean, like, um, what's his name? Rankin, who started Dazed, yeah. has like a beautiful penthouse and a private studio and like owns half of an apartment block. But he's the exception to the rule. I mean, he's a brilliant photographer. There's a lot of brilliant photographers, but he just like, say Kit Butler, for example, is an exception to the rule. He is the photographer who was at the right place, at the right time, had the right skills, and was a clever businessman, and turned it into a business. But how many brilliant photographers do you meet who are amazing photographers, who maybe are at the right place at the right time, but aren't good business people, or are great business people, but don't get the opportunity? You see it in music. How many Ed Sheerans are out there? There's only one real Ed Sheeran, though. It's, it's, it's the same with 